Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Michael Feldstein uh, from Illiterate. Um, welcome to the Illiterate Standard of Proof uh, webinar series um, here at the historic Muppet Theater. Um, this is our, our second webinar in this series. We're thrilled to have you all here. Um, this week we'll be uh, talking about uh, the LX Pathways Competency-Based Credentials Program um, developed by iDesign. I'm thrilled to have uh, Whitney Kilgore, iDesign's Chief Learning Officer, and Patrice Torsivia Prusco, the Associate Director of Learning Design at Harvard University Graduate School of Education's Teaching Learning Lab with me as well as our um, our uh, web moderator, uh, chief technologist, and jack of all trades, uh, John Prasinski. Um, uh, great to have you all here. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background um, on the webinar series, and then we'll dive right in. So, Standard of Proof webinar is um, an outgrowth of uh, eLiterate's Empirical Educator Project, um, and um, the uh, the name is um, essentially uh, underlining two ideas. One is that we really ought to be um, um, focusing uh, our attention on on products and offerings in the marketplace um, in ed tech that have some evidence of actually working. Um, or uh, that um, promote an evidence base uh, that um, is already established in academic research. And the other is that um, we ought to pay attention to companies um, in the market that um, help us do this, um, uh, which is why I'm pleased uh, to have iDesign here today. Um, they've been uh, a great sponsor from the very beginning of Empirical Educator Project and a longtime friend of Illiterate. Um, they've done been a good actor in the space, um, and I think you'll find um, from the project uh, uh, that you're going to hear about today um, that they do some interesting work. Uh, but you don't have to take my word for it. Um, one of the premises of Standard of Proof uh, is that any project that is featured on this webinar needs to have an academic partner who has been a, a, a credible um, uh, collaborator in some way, who can vouch for the work. Um, and we're lucky to have Patrice here to talk uh, about her experiences with LX Pathways. Uh, so without further ado, I'm, I'm delighted to see the level of attention that we have here. We, we have a, you know, a good uh, registration list and hopefully get a good turnout. Um, last thing I'll say before we dive in is that uh, this web webinar will be made available as a, an archive on uh, the eLiterate's YouTube channel, eLiterate TV, uh, and it will be available under Creative Commons license. So please do uh, share uh, as need be with your colleagues. Um, and this is good work, and we hope that you'll help bring attention to it. So Whitney, um, why don't you start us off? Tell us a little bit about um, the problem that caused you to start thinking about the project that became LX Pathways. Sure, that's a great place to start. Oh, um, uh, we're not hearing your audio, Whitney. Okay, let's try a quick shift. Um, Still not hearing your audio. I I can hear I can hear. Folks, we 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 did an audio check okay. just two minutes well, ago, you, so we can uh, I don't know hear. Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, I think not. everybody but Michael can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not hearing you either, Patrice. Maybe it's me. Yeah. John, all right, can you nod? All right, all right, if you nod, if you're here, if they're hearing them, I'm not hearing them. Okay. Okay. So it's, okay. I can hear you now. So, okay. All bad. Yeah. See, yeah, the wiring here at the historic Muppet Theater is not what it used to be. Um, you know, Animal and the, and the band had their effects over time. So please. <laughs> Uh, start over with me. <laughs> no worries. Um, so the, the history or the, the business problem we were trying to solve um, kind of starts with the fact that, you know, we're a seven and a half year old company, iDesign. And, and when, when we got started in this space, um, finding talent, 
was pretty easy. Uh, as, as a young company, we knew a lot of individuals that worked in learning design that we were able to, to work with, recruit, um, and it was pretty, pretty easy to go to LinkedIn and, and post, hey, we're hiring, right? Get in touch. And it was not uncommon for, say, you know, 20 people to send me a note. And after talking to 20 people, we'd find one that might be a good fit based on the time they had available and the, the project that we were looking to staff. Um, that wasn't really scalable. Um, we're currently at about 165 learning designers. And to get to that scale, if I had to multiply that by 20 and talk to that many people to find those individuals, that, that wouldn't have worked for us. So over time, we created new ways to attract talent and to um, really identify who were the right players to come be a part of um, this high touch learning design support network that we've developed to really help faculty transition from face to face to online or blended teaching. And, um, and so kind of an intermediate step for us before we even got to LX Pathways was to create a Google form and we posted a job on higher ed jobs. Then we had a really incredible turnout. We had over 500 people apply to one job posting. So we, we ended up with a, a pretty interesting shift in the paradigm on how we were going to sift through 500 applicants or potential um, interviewees instead of 20, right? So, so we created a course in Canvas that told the story about who we are as an organization, the work that we do, and then um, little video vignettes, like a day in the life of a learning architect, a day in the life of an instructional technologist, and made those available to those folks that were applying so they'd better understand what the role was because there's a funny thing that happens in our space where everyone identifies as an instructional designer in some way. So by kind of telling them the story of what the role actually is, and then pr presenting them with 10 quiz questions, some they answered with video, some were more technical in nature, one, some were accessibility focused, um, alignment focused. So we, we were able to kind of use that 10 question quiz to filter. Um, the uh, individuals and, and start with the high score, right? Um, but by going from uh, putting that course out in front, we went from 500 applicants basically that came through the higher ed job site down to 187 that actually completed the interview questions. And um, so that was a pretty fascinating uh, way to filter out um, the folks that we actually wanted to speak with. And then we evaluated the individuals using an internal rubric. It wasn't a score anybody saw, but then we were able to interview the, the folks with the high score and, and spend some time with them, get to know them and see if there was a fit and a great opportunity for them and for us to collaborate with those individuals. So um, then we, then the kind of the next big phase for us was we thought about onboarding um, individuals in a really thoughtful way. And the more we got into identifying the competencies that would be needed for individuals coming in from different spaces, um, we decided to flip the paradigm. And instead of it being onboarding, this training that we built out, these LX pathways, we decided to open them up. And, and turn this into our new recruiting paradigm. So individuals can earn micro-credentials or a certificate in becoming a, a learning architect or an instructional technologist. And then we have the opportunity to hire the best and the brightest. We're seeing their portfolios. We're seeing evidence of mastery of all these competencies. So it just creates a, a new paradigm for us around recruiting. Okay. so so. There's a lot to unpack there, and before we we get to flipping the paradigm, I want to I want to step back um, one step um, and talk about that um, recruitment video where you talk about who you are, what you do, what the job of a learning architect is at I Design. What is that story? Because I think it's important for us to talk about the changing nature of this work in academia. Right. Yeah. So in, a, in a, just a thumbnail sketch, what is that story? 
Yeah, so um, for us, the learning architect is an individual who has great expertise in both teaching and learning in an online environment. They've got probably about 10 or 15 years of experience, uh, expertise, if you will, in designing online learning experiences for students with faculty or subject matter experts. And, um, and so it's a true partnership or collaboration between the faculty at a university campus or the subject matter expert, depending on the, the role or the field or who we're working with, and helping them conceive of the curriculum or the content that would come together to create a holistic student-centered learning experience. So the learning architect is really the, I'll say the faculty whisperer, right? The, um, the person behind the scenes, behind the curtain, the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> if you will, who's helping make the magic happen, the unsung heroes of higher education, right? Um, then but the instructional technologist is more focused on bringing all of the tools together and building inside the learning management system or extending with learning tools, so LTI tools and beyond. And so the, those two roles are very distinct and different. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we spelled it out to individuals that were considering coming down that road with us. So those are two, so two titles, two roles learning architect and instructional technologist that exist inside iDesign, your company, where the people with those titles will work um, with uh, uh, university folks in designing courses and curriculum. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the new world. Now, now, Patrice, in your world, you're dealing with students who are, who are coming up in your program and they're you know, probably looking at a range of career options. How does all of this um, resonate with, you know, your, your interactions with your students, how you're helping them think about where they're going, um, and how, why was this interesting to you? Sure, so uh, currently one of the programs at the School of Education is TIE Technology in Education. And um, our team, the Teaching and Learning Lab, supports a course called a T127, which is a practicum course that is primary. Most of the students that enroll in that course are in the technology and education. We occasionally get students from policy and leadership and other areas. And that course is one of the only courses where students actually have the opportunity to opportunity to apply some of what they're learning. And so in the classroom, they're getting a lot of the learning theory, learning about new models of education, backwards design, all that good stuff. Um, but in addition to that, they're embedded um, into our team and they are actually working with us on projects that we're working on. So in that role, they might get the opportunity to see what goes on in the studio or how you edit video, what goes into a design document. Um, and as much as possible, we include them in meetings and, you know, different, so they can really understand that, that aspect. Um, but a missing piece that, you know, many of us find um, that is a gap is, you know, you, you go to school, you have these experiences, but you don't learn about project management or a lot of those other wraparound skills that a learning designer needs. And so in many cases, we were incorporating um, some workshops for students around some of those other skill sets. And so uh, uh, as part of that process, um, I do a lot of mentoring and coaching of the students. And one of their primary questions is, you know, what does a hiring company look for? You know, if I want to go work as an instructional designer, what are the skills that I should be developing? And so I actually invited Whitney um, to be a guest speaker in the classroom to talk with the students about, you know, what, what does iDesign look for when they're hiring students? You know, what are areas that they should really try and, you know, make sure they present in their resume? And it just happened to coincide with the beta testing of LX Pathways. And so it was a really great opportunity for our students to both hear from Whitney, but then participate in LX Pathways. And for me, um, I, it's been a great way to recommend to students who are wondering, you know, what does it mean to be an instructional technologist versus a learning architect? And, you know, what are all the different competencies? 
and while we try to um, help them gain some of the skills that they need. I mean, I really appreciate that um, there's a wide variety of skill sets they can jump into in the LX pathways. You know, everything from like the LMS to quality to project management to you know leadership, and there's a lot of different tracks. And so I think that it's really um, a great addition for our, for students who are or you know people who are already out in the profession. You know, to try and enhance the you know some of the theory that they're already getting yeah i want to come back to the competency-based nature of the program in a little bit and to and talk about what the experience of that was like for your students but um first of all, I, how did you know whitney <laughs> uh, <laughs> whitney and i met several years ago at a conference and we um, found that we had a lot of common interests around learning design, design thinking, as well as STEM education. And so we collaborated on some conference proposals. We taught um, the human MOOC together. We've done some research studies. We've written some articles. We've gone to conferences. Yeah. The reason I ask is that this is an important lesson for standard of proof and what we're trying to establish here, right? Good companies, the ones that you want to have relationships with, already have relationships with academics that are organic, long-term, and collaborative. So this is, I you know, spoiler, I knew the answer to this already, but uh, um, this is a good example. Um, of um, how collaborate. Now, there's nothing wrong with the company coming, uh, approaching a customer in a structured way and saying, hey, we'd really like to work with you. That's a, that's a good practice too. Uh, but it's always a good sign when there are authentic organic relationships. So having said that, okay, let's go back, Whitney, to your point about you've got this hiring challenge growth in the company is good, that's great. You, the challenge is you've got everybody in the world who has got instructional designer label on their resume. Um, you wanna get the best people and maybe you wanna get people who, are, uh, who have some great um, talents, mm -hmm. but not quite, they, they're missing a couple of boxes checked on their training and if they just could check a couple of those boxes, they would be the right people for you. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit more about how you flipped uh, the script on the whole recruitment process. How does LX Pathways work as a recruitment tool mechanically for you? What, what's, the, yeah. what's the pipeline now? Yeah, we've had a couple of people reach out to us and share resumes with us who didn't quite have all the skill sets that we felt like they needed. Their portfolio might have been lacking in some specific manner. And we've been able, since LX Pathways was launched last July, we've been able to point them to LX Pathways and particular competencies that might help them grow in that space. So that's been helpful from that perspective to be able to give people some really specific feedback and point them to a tool that can help them get where they wanna go instead of just pointing them out to the world of you know, master's degree programs and other, you know, training resources or not knowing exactly where to send them because there's not a perfect fit for what they need. Um, so um, I ran across, we were at InstructureCon last summer and ran across a colleague there and she had just hired a videographer who had um, no skills in instructional design or curriculum alignment or really even how to communicate with faculty about how video could fit into a structured learning experience. And so when I was sharing LX Pathways with her, she said, this would be perfect for my video videographer who doesn't understand how to communicate the importance of connecting that video component to 
exercises and activities or align it back to the learning outcomes of the course. So being able to support someone maybe not in a learning architect or even instructional technologist pathway, but to um, become like Patrice said about project management. Some of those wraparound thinking elements that can help someone continue to grow in the field regardless of the role that they particularly fill inside an institution. Um, does that help in, in kind of framing that a little bit that with real stories? <laughs> yes. Now there's some overlap in the competencies between those two roles. Yes. So the, it's funny, the competency naming it might be consistent from role to role, but what we found was um, in teasing out the specific objectives within a particular role, an instructional technologist might need a particular level of understanding related to, say, learning theory, where a learning architect really needs to know how to apply that and have a conversation with a subject matter expert or a faculty member in how they might leverage activities and assessments and assignments to be able to achieve those outcomes and how they might leverage a, a learning theory like ARCs or ADI or whatnot in order to make that happen. The instructional technologist who's doing the build still needs to understand it. And we also want to make sure we're scaffolding them into future careers. Perhaps an instructional technologist gets a general understanding of learning theory, but then when they become a learning architect, they need a higher level of understanding. So some of those are scaffolded situations that um, will continue to go forward as we add new tracks. So I guess there are two um, MacGuffins that we chase with um, competency-based learning. One is, you know, these reusable chunks of content, and the other is um, the phrase that you actually uh, have used uh, with LX Pathways, which is choose your own adventure. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk about how much of each of those goals is realistic to uh, aspire to when you design for roles that are overlapping and have some similar needs, but when you get down to a granular level, you start discovering some important differences. So uh, yeah, and the choose your own adventure piece was kind of um, challenging for us in the, in the, the work that we did to kind of unpack what are these competencies. We, we relied on the IBSTPI standards to really help us in framing our thinking. So if you're not familiar with the IBSTPI standards, they're the instructional design standards that have been in place for quite some time. Um, and for anybody who caught that I said ADI and um, ARCs, I meant instructional design models and I said learning theory, my mistake. Super excited to be here with you, Michael, I flubbed. Um, wow. But um, thinking, thinking about the choose your own adventure, when, you, when you've got the ability to go where you need to go and pick up the competency that you need. Some of those pieces feel like they need to be linear in the flow of how you would acquire those skills. And so we created tracks that lead to micro credentials versus the individual competencies that you can jump into their individual courses so they stand alone. And we tried to make sure that we were being thoughtful in how they were designed so they could really stand alone. So the, um, the, in, the information that you need to connect to is there, the scaffolding is there, um, but unpacking and creating a non-linear learning experience is sometimes challenging for learning designers who are used to creating very structured linear learning experiences with and for faculty. So it really um, challenged some of our thinking and we continued to have internal conversations. I won't call them struggles, but conversations yeah. about yeah. how do we do this really thoughtfully and there was, there was a point where in order to create it self-paced and choose your own adventure, you have to start to separate what is a knowledge objective that can be graded with a multiple choice test versus what is a performance objective where we can actually observe a demonstration of mastery by the learner to then award them the certificate. So there were some really thoughtful processes that we had to work through internally and we are very blessed to have incredible talent on our team so 
these were not casual decisions. These were thoughtful um, uh, arguments uh, in order to get across the finish line with what we think is a really um, a solid learning experience. And thanks to the students at, at Harvard Graduate School of Education for their feedback. Uh, we were able to you know, use that data information to make adjustments to what is now available for everyone. So that was where I was going to go next, actually. And this is really state-of-the-art stuff that we're talking about right now. These are the hard problems that the field has been wrestling with for a long time, but I think developments in terms of the need, the demand and the kinds of the diversity of needs um, have um, driven the conversation to new places. Um, and so, um, I wonder, and I'll, I'll leave this open to e either one of you to start, um, but I, I wonder if you could talk um, first about the degree to which this kind of design level conversation um, came up in your interactions uh, with, the, with the Harvard students. So I'm happy to jump into this one unless Patrice, you wanna go first. Okay. 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 So um, the feedback from the students, uh, we had total. We had some other folks beyond the the Harvard graduate students, um, but um, but all total, we had about fifteen folks in our beta cohort, and the the feedback was quite interesting. There was a um, a pushback, if you will, on wanting it to be more linear because that's the way we grow up in education. I mean, right. all the way, I mean, pre-K through, you know, 20 plus, because <laughs> I think we're all still kind of in school and learning all the time. Um, we're, we're learning in a very linear fashion. So, so they, they did bring that to the table and raise that. Um, but in order to be true to the opportunity to provide this unbundled choose your own adventure kind of um, pathway, we had to say, you know, we had to give them some advice and some counsel on why we designed it that way. And once we talked about it, they felt much more relaxed about the fact that it was meant to be that way. Um, but the feedback was really fantastic on creating to-do lists. And there was some great feedback on how we could continue to optimize the navigation. So, um, so we were able to take that input and then adapt before we went live to the general public. So it was very helpful to do that beta cohort. Okay. Patrice? Uh, so I think in general, we find that um, it, incorporating student voice is extremely important um, and our students are very thoughtful and intentional. Um, so I really appreciated that they had the opportunity both to participate in the beta test, but also to give feedback to iDesign and that they were you know, taking the time to step back, listen to the student voice and give them that opportunity to share their share their experiences. And I also for them experiencing what it's like to go through a competency based model was a learning experience for them. Like it's one of the things that we talk about in this course that they take. But, um, but it's one thing again, it's one thing hearing about the theory and talking about it and then actually having that experience. And so that was also, um, I think that was also very beneficial for them. How, how do you talk about that a little bit more, please? How do you think that, um, uh, because we very often, more often than not, have people designing cutting edge learning experiences who have not gone through them as learners. So how do you think, um, that dual lens of experiencing the course simultaneously from the designer's view and from the learner's view impacted their their thinking coming out of it. Well, I, I so I, and one of the unique things within my team is that um, all of my learning designers. Um, are graduates of the Harvard Graduate School of Education and now designing courses for the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh -huh. So that's a little bit meta right there. And okay. then um, one of the courses that we, um, 
one of the projects that we're working on right now is a course called How People Learn, which is a fully online course that right now is optional, but starting next year, all incoming master's students will be required to take it before they come to campus. So we've had a really great opportunity where the past two summers, um, our some, of, some of our incoming students have taken the How People Learn course. Then they come to campus and they participate in focus groups and we have a group called SET, which is the student experience team. So they are, at, they are able to be both um, students during the summer of the course and then when they come here and they're embedded on projects on our team or they participate in the SET, they're actually able to have a window into that design process if they're working on a project with us and to provide feedback. Um, and I think that that's been a really positive experience for them as well as for us that they have that dual role. Mm. Um, and it did make me think about, you know, one of the things that we frequently come up against, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but um, a lot of times we work with faculty who've never taken an online course or taught an online course. And so spaces where they can experience it that before they go into the design process are also really important. Yeah, I, I want to come back to that. That's an important, um, that's an important point. Before I get to that, uh, a couple of uh, pieces I want to touch on. Whitney, what was it like um, uh, for you and for iDesign um, to have this uh, feedback from the Harvard students? How did that impact your development of the product? So we, we were able to incorporate quite a bit of the feedback that came from those students. And, and we, we took an interesting approach with how we collected the data. There's a, um, a really fantastic book called Liberating Structures. And one of the, there's 32, 33 different ways that you can situate conversations. So it can be really useful in the design of online experiences, as well as in uh, trying to figure out how you might present at a conference or other things. So hot tip for anybody listening. Um, but we took what they call a UX fishbowl approach to bringing their feedback to us. So we seeded a couple of questions and then just sat back and listened to them document and tell stories to each other about their experiences inside LX Pathways. And so it gave us the opportunity to take notes and, and um, so it was more um, qualitative feedback that we were able to really make use of. Um, yeah, I think it was really Im an important step for us to make sure that we were incorporating that student voice and the fact that they had the background in that learning design space was really powerful as well. I think, you know, all of the fundamentals that they had learned within uh, HGSE was powerful to bring to the table so that we were hearing from their perspective what they were seeing, right? We do a lot of quality review work inside the learning design work we do on a regular basis. And so it's, it's not uncommon for us to have as many as three different quality checkpoints in, this, in a, the design of a single course. So this as an extra set of feedback for us before we went to market was ex extremely powerful. Mm. And, you know, inside iDesign, you asked about application of design principles or having that background um, as the students were looking at LX Pathways. I think from a design perspective inside iDesign as we were going through the development competency alignment to the ONET database and other things, that process for us, um, design is always a team sport for us, which is why we have so many different roles beyond the learning architect and the instructional technologist, we often have a graphic designer, a quality reviewer, video post-production people. So there are more things to come on LX Pathways. Um, but the team-based approach we took to designing LX Pathways was an absolute must for us to go to market with this unbundled competency-based adventure with an ED, right, adventure. Um, and I think, um, you know, we had worked with schools that are doing competency-based education very well. Um, and we work with more objective-based education, uh, the more linear approach versus the unbundled kind of um, uh, uh, pathways, if you will. And I, 
it was really powerful to have all of those different skill sets come to the table. Yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons I wanted to ask this, this is another overarching theme of standard of proof on the, on the vendor side, which is that there are reasons beyond marketing and branding for doing this kind of work. Um, you just end up with better products. This is not, you know, the kind of thing, uh, educational products are not the kind of thing you can do well just with a handful of focus group groups and a couple of touch points with customers, especially if you're really working on, on these sorts of found, um, you know, frontier challenges. Um, and Whitney, I think you've, you've articulated beautifully, you know, just how this, um, uh, orchestra needs to work, um, in order to, to, produce something that is a good end product and, and, you know, collaboration, close collaboration with um, the experts who are sometimes your customers, sometimes the researchers who inform uh, uh, what you are learning how to do well, sometimes both um, is, is critical. Mm -hmm. um, so, I have, um, I, I, I want to just transition. I have one or two more frontier questions, and then I want to get back to Patrice's point about the folks at the other end of the caravan, the ones bringing up the rear that we want to make sure we don't lose. Um, uh, one of these questions uh, comes from the audience. So Lisa Johnson asks, this is all about credentials. We, when we start talking about these micro-credentials, we often, we often get into stackability and the model where we see that happening most often is in, is in tech, right? And so Lisa asks, uh, is the title full stack I, uh, instructional designer used for individuals who demonstrate mastery in both instructional technologist and learning architect roles? Is that a thing? I think that can be a thing if Lisa wants it to be a thing. We're seeing such a change in the field right now. I mean, and when you think of the evolution of instructional design over the last 10 years, but let's go back 20, right? Um, it, people kind of had different paths into instructional design. Uh, it's much like how the web has changed, right? And if you think of web design today, it's very, very different than it was in the early days. And you have specializations or specialty um, titles across a, a marketing team, perhaps, that does all kinds of different web and marketing type work. Um, in instructional design, we're seeing the emergence of the term learning engineer, right? And uh, Patrice and I have a, a paper that we wrote with a colleague, Lori Gogia, that's, that's um, an Educause review. And so the field is shifting. I think there are more and more specialty things that people are going to expect. And more and more, we're gonna see design as a team-based sport, like I mentioned earlier. And when we look at the Chloe report that came from Edgy Ventures and Quality Matters, it speaks to design teams working with faculty, leading to more student-centered and student-to-student -student engagement and, um, and interactivity. So I think the field is gonna to continue to evolve. We're seeing growth in the job market for folks with the title instructional design, learning architect, learning engineer. All those things are starting to increase in both need and, um, and volume. Mm -hmm. um, when, uh, Patrice, when you think about your students um, in this regard and they, you know, they get their degree or their certificate or uh, whatever it is, right? Um, what are you thinking about in terms of the touch points afterwards and the credentials or micro credentials that they might come back to you for after that initial credential for your program? What do you have now and what are you thinking about in the future, what is what is the future of work for your students? So, a couple of different questions there. Um, currently, the only thing that we offer is the master's. Well, I mean, there's a PhD program also, but I mean, we we offer the master's 
degree as a residential program. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned the, the fully online course that they take the summer before, but that's the, then they come here to Cambridge and it's, it's a resident, it's a one year residential program. Um, we don't currently offer um, within, you know, the School of Education, um, my team, like certificates and things like that. We do have um, part of the School of Education is programs and professional development, which we call PPE. And they do offer um, some programs that is primarily professional development geared towards teachers, um, principals, superintendents. And so they're doing more of that, that the, they're, they're complementing their residential programs with some online programs. But as far as I know, they do not currently offer any type of professional development that would be con something that like an instructional designer might come back for. Mm -hmm. um, so from that standpoint, you know, they kind of like graduate and then call me up when they need a reference. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I do, as I mentioned, like I do spend a lot of time mentoring them and coaching them um, because a lot of them come in you know, they've heard about ed tech or they were like a K through 12 teacher that used ed tech and they're interested in getting into this field. But to Whitney's point, they don't really know what does it mean to be a learning designer or a learning engineer or an instructional technologist. Do I want to work in higher ed or do I want to work in corporate? And K 12 even. There's yeah. Yeah. That happening there yeah. too. Um, and so there is still a gap of kind of like what what does that career pathway look like? And now, you know, we do see that changing. And I think that, you know, like more and more we are seeing, um, I, I wrote an article on burnout about this. You know, we're, we're seeing instructional designers being asked to do everything. You know, I called it like the Swiss army knife. You know, the, and many of them, they come in because they are very creative, caring, passionate people that want to create these amazing learning experiences, but then they're also asked to be event planners and project managers. Um, and in many cases, um, leadership doesn't always know what resources are needed to create these experiences and what goes into it. And so I hope that, you know, if we think about the future of work, you know, we will be moving towards a lot of what Whitney was talking about, where, you know, we'll, there'll be more, some specialization. We will have um, people who are, you know, teams that have a dedicated project manager or, you know, people that are dedicated to some of these different tasks. And I could even, you know, I can imagine that, you know, we talk a lot about how like chatbots and things might help teachers, you know, not have to do like FAQs and things like that and spend more time working with, you know, their learners. So I could imagine, that helping instructional designers, you know, and what are those tasks that instructional designers have to do that don't require that human contact or creativity that only they can do and not certainly not replacing them. But again, like um, taking off of their plate, some of those more um, tasks so that they can focus on those things that only they can do. Um, and I like to imagine about, um, you know, what will it be like when a robot is a member of our team? And so maybe, you know, as a learning designer, somebody on your team will be a robot. Mm. Um, I can make a sarcastic comment about suggesting, suspecting that some of them are today, <laughs> but I rather I'll go in a more productive way. Actually, I, I do have a robot who is a member of my team right now, and I'd like to talk about the one that's strapped to my wrist um, in terms, and I'd like to go use that to, to connect back to that question of the people uh, at the back end of the wagon trail, which my wife will tell you I am usually that person in many respects in my life. One of which is um, this thing tells me, um, dude, you've been sitting in your chair for six hours. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be a good idea to stand up? And then I stand up and I get a badge for that. Like I get a badge for standing up. And that, you know, that seems pathetic. My, my, my granddaughter has pretty much flat out told me that's pathetic, but um, but in fact, it motivates me, right? The, the, the micro-credential, the small 
bite-sized thing, the reminder at the right moment of the thing that I can handle and fit into my life that moves me forward and moves me towards a habit, right? There's a breadcrumb trail that becomes a guided pathway um, is uh, towards this thing that we call a, you know, a badge, a micro-credential, where I can feel like, oh, I accomplished something. It's a streak. I, I stood up, you know, enough time to get a ba- to get a badge. You know, don't I want to stay on that streak, right? So I, I wonder, you, you both have to, um, you're the faculty whisperers, right? You're, you're the ones who have to be on the front line with these folks every day, the ones who are busy dealing with all kinds of crises that are not the ones that you're trying to get them to worry about necessarily. Um, so you're the ones who have a more realistic um, sense of what's possible than I am. Am is it unrealistic to think that there is a role for micro credentialing for faculty to start to develop literacy in this area? In in that a faculty member, you know, a teaching faculty member might be coaxed in, into into a little bit of uh, learning design expertise, um, just enough to, to feel like, you know, maybe they're solving an immediate problem. Maybe they're getting out of a chair for a minute a day or solving some problem that they perceive to be an immediate point pain point in their course that moves them on to something else. Is that a frontier we can think about or do we need something more structural to de- to remove obstacles for them first? I'll jump into that one because that sounds fun. Um, I I absolutely think it's it's possible, Um, but I I think oftentimes the stories that I hear is um, that faculty are given an empty course shell two weeks before the course is supposed to go live. Um, There was a a recent announcement where I think um, a university just put all of the courses online in like two days or something like that, a recent article. Um, But they don't necessarily have the skills to build, right? So I like to drive my car. I I really like to drive my car. I don't do it very often, but when I do, I I enjoy it. But I don't want to go build a car, right? So there's, there's some skills that are needed to be an effective communicator and facilitator of online learning. And I think we have to start there and work backward. And decide does a faculty member as they're coming through the ranks um, through their doctoral work do they need to be taking courses in how people learn like the course Patrice mentioned earlier absolutely do they need to be able to build the car in order to drive it probably not but as the technologies continue to evolve and become more and more user friendly because the web has changed so much since many of us got started in this field of instructional design. Um, It could become more seamless. I would love to see haptic feedback, like you get from your Apple Watch when it tells you to breathe, Michael, that helps faculty remember to um, send regular and substantive communication to their students, be proactive with grading and feedback and, and specific with how students can continue to improve. Maybe we could move away from, um, you know, really high stakes assessment and and break those things down into smaller bite-sized chunks for learners. Uh, There there are lots of things, lots of problems for us to solve when I think about the instructional design space. And then when I think about what faculty need to do in any given day between committees and their face-to-face teaching and committees and the, um, the things that they're you know, pulled at uh, hallway conversations and things that are pulled in a million different directions, office hours, everything that they do, do they also need us to um, help them learn how to build their car? I, yeah. I struggle with that every day. So, so go ahead, Patrice. Yeah. I was right. So I, I mean, I think that that's a really interesting idea and certainly it would be dependent upon 
from university to university and what that what the yes. culture of that college is, the size, the budgets they have, research versus teaching. Um, but I could imagine spaces for that. A, a lot of colleges um, require faculty development before a, you know instructor can teach online. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine you know that there might be like micro credentials that somebody might want to take to enhance their skills after they've gone through um, faculty development. I could also, you know, think about colleges and universities that don't have a budget. You know, like a lot of these universities have one instructional designer, right? And like that's it. And so wouldn't that be helpful if maybe there were other resources that they could have their instructors and faculties go through to, you know, to gain some of these skills. Um, and I've heard of successful, successful programs where you know that a, a university might have like a fellows program right and again like you know you get some sort of grant and release time which is really important and often overlooked piece um to go through and do some faculty development and you know and take a course but you know like to whitney's point like faculty are balancing a lot of different things um and i i would wonder about how the um, the way the content is presented maybe would be slightly different, right? If a faculty member was the audience versus like somebody who's going into the instructional design field. Well, and, and we do have the data from the Chloe report, yeah. which I mentioned earlier that just shows that when we're collaborating with others, so this whole notion of a team, right, helps, uh, you know, drive student engagement and increase the interactivity levels. So I, I do think that even, even if they're just collaborating with each other, so maybe in some of those models where faculty do have the professional development, support, resources, time, and stipends, if they're able to build their own communities of practice and, and support one another and ideate, then I think you're also going to potentially see some 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 decent designs and improved interaction. I do wonder if we need to think about, um, though, to challenge the assumptions. Yes, faculty need support. Yes, they need um, release time. Yes, they need stipends and all of that. But I wonder if we need to challenge ourselves in thinking about faculty in the same way that we need to challenge ourselves in thinking about post-traditional students. That, you know, maybe, maybe we need to rethink our course designs and support uh, surround models um, and, and granularity of course size, as you've done with LX Pathways um, in, in some ways to, to, to accommodate who they are, where they are, what they can do in any given moment, and what calls them to learn in what size granularity. Um, I would invite you both to jump in on, on that, but I, I see we're coming up on the hour, and, and Whitney, before we close, since I think we probably have in this audience some good candidates for the LX Pathways course, I just want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the experience um, of taking uh, it. Uh, let me just actually also check. Oh, where is the historic Muppet Theater located? It's in Candyland, of course. Um, uh, um, so it's at, it's at the end of the Rainbow Connection. Um, so uh, if you could just talk a little bit about more about the experience of the LX Pathways uh, course as a student, including uh, maybe one or two aspects that you, we haven't gone over, such as um, there's, there's actually pretty significant involvement um, from uh, iDesign staff, personal involvement um, uh, in reviewing student activity. This isn't one of those take a bunch of multiple choice quizzes and, and get a robo certificate kind of thing. Um, so why don't you tell, tell folks a little bit about what they'd be, um, what, what it would be like for them to, to jump into LX Pathways as a student. Yeah, happy to, Michael. So um, we have two different tracks that are currently published. We talked a little bit about the instructional technologist and the learning architect. Uh, the first course in each of those pathways is free and open, so folks can take a look at how, it's, uh, how it unfolds, how the learning unfolds, and decide if it's right for them. 
And um, the courses are the competencies, and then, and then there are four tracks per pathway. So um, what that means is, as an instructional technologist, you may take 11 individual competencies, but they roll up into four different micro-credentials. So badges are awarded when a bundle of two to four courses are taken together to create those different tracks. So in the instructional technologist pathway, those tracks are you know, learning theories and design models, the user experience track, educational technology and accessibility and project management soft skills. So um, we have future plans for additional tracks, which I'll talk about in just a second. But to your point about the involvement of our team, the portfolio piece is separate from all of these individual competencies or courses. So, and we have made it so that you can take the competencies and courses, earn the micro-credentials if you need that piece of the puzzle, that scaffolding to get to a portfolio that you could present for review. But if someone comes to us and they already have a portfolio, there is no need for them to take all those individual competencies. They're ready to move ahead and have their portfolio reviewed. So we have unpacked even the competencies from the portfolio. So uh, the portfolio course is managed by senior leadership within iDesign. So when someone goes to that portfolio course and wants to have their portfolio reviewed, we spend the time to do the work to manage a single point rubric and then meet with individuals one-on-one -on -one via Zoom, just like this, to give them that personalized feedback on how they could improve their portfolio and talk to them about career pathways. Um, to Patrice's point earlier, are they interested in working in higher ed, K-12, or corporate learning? Those are very different spaces at the moment, may continue to be very different spaces over time. And so um, if, if it is a great fit for us to employ that individual, we can have that conversation. But we also know a lot of people in the field that are hiring. So we can make recommendations or introductions if it's right, the right sense for them. So um, yeah, so we're investing that time and energy into those individuals. And then when I take a look at what the future of LX Pathways looks like for us, we have plans to add an accessibility specialist pathway next. Uh, we've already done the competency work, so it's just a matter of um, the build process. So I don't, I don't know if we'll launch that later this year, if it'll be next year, but coming soon. And then next after that is um, a track for project management specific to instructional design. So what you see inside of the instructional technologist pathway and the learning architect pathway is a little bit about accessibility. And we're gonna build a specialist pathway. You see a little bit about project management, but we're gonna build a, a project management specialist pathway. And then beyond that, we'll get into leaders of learning design. So more to come from us on LX Pathways over the the course of the next few years. And and just briefly, beyond the first, you know, module or chunk that's free, there is a cost recovery fee because obviously you're investing time in this, right? So what is the cost to, to complete one of these certificate programs? So the competencies themselves are $50. And so different tracks, because it's a different number of courses, add up to be different amounts. Um, so the, the pathway all told with the portfolio is extremely affordable. Folks, that's more than my monthly comic book budget, or less than my monthly comic book. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I've just revealed more to you than I really wanted to. But, but uh, um, yeah, uh, clearly that's... Um, um, you know, standard of proof, again, it, it, one, of the, one of the criteria is that there's community contribution. That doesn't always mean free because sometimes there is a cost of doing these things. This clearly falls within the, the bounds of a community contribution uh, that I design is, is making. Um, and so um, I hope you all uh, think about it. We uh, were delighted to have you all here. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, um, we will be making this available uh, on YouTube. So watch for it on the eLiterate TV YouTube channel. Um, and there will be a couple of more um, uh, uh, eLiterate uh, standard of proof webinars that aren't quite announced yet, but will be very, very soon.
coming up in March. Um, so stay tuned, folks. Thanks again to, to Whitney and Patrice for being wonderful panelists and to the great John Prasinski uh, for, um, uh, as our Chief Justice once said, uh, doing very little and doing it extremely well. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and take care.